recording. Um, the League is a nonpartisan political organization whose mission for the past 101 years is making democracy work. The League considers redistricting to be one of the most important political events because it affects citizen representation in the US. And then we have to live with its effects for 10 years. So our redistricting cycle began in 2020 with the census. And that 2020 census was unlike anything in US history. We had online completion of the questionnaire for the first time, the threat of a citizen question, citizenship question, maybe not for the last time, underfunding, changing deadlines, and a pandemic that hindered in-person census taking. The final results were delayed and that delayed the start of the mapping process. And now that delay shortens the time for citizen response to the proposed maps. So the purpose of our webinar today is education. What is redistricting its history in Hawaii? What the legal requirements are and, and understanding the process and the maps that are drawn. To lead us in our learning is our moderator today, Sherry Bracken. Many of you know Sherry from her 17 years as a Hawaii Island radio reporter for local radio stations and for Hawaii Public Radio. We see her often on the Big Island interviewing prominent people and moderating candidate and issue forums. She retired last year, but she can be coaxed out of retirement, <laughs> especially when the topic is important. Please welcome Sherry Bracken. Thank you very much, Donna. I appreciate it. And as Donna said, I retired in December from news reporting, but clearly I'm still very interested in what's happening here in the state and on the island in politics and in voting. And that's really important. And I'm really delighted that the League of Women Voters is putting on this and they'll be putting on additional forums in the future, just because we need to continue to be educated in what's happening and how we can have an impact. As Donna said, today we're going to be talking about reapportionment, redistricting with two primary speakers, both of whom are actively engaged with this topic. Retired University of Hawaii Professor Ann Lee will talk about the history and state of reapportionment here in Hawaii. And Dylan Nonaka, who's a member of the State Reapportionment Commission, will give us an update about where we are in the state and about how you may have input. And after that, our speakers will take questions. And by the way, regarding questions, we're joined today by two representatives from the State Elections Office, David Rosenbrock and Royce Jones. And they've been involved with the mapping and the software that helps get the maps drawn. And thank you for being with us, all of you who are going to be speaking, because this will be quite helpful. Our plan is to go for an hour today and We'd like all the participants other than the speakers to stay mute. And we will take questions after Dr. Lee and Mr. Nonaka talk. And we're going to do that via the chat function of Zoom. And if you don't know where the chat function is, if you put, move your cursor down at the bottom, there's a message box looking thing that says chat. And then when you click on that, it brings up a little chat box you can send your question to everyone, or you can send it to me, and if you don't want to share it with everybody, and then I'll be asking the questions of our speakers after they talk. Our first speaker is Dr. Ann Fetter Lee. She has published a book about the Hawaii State Constitution, which you may still find on Amazon. She co-authored a publication on Hawaiian sovereignty. Her PhD is in political science, and she really does know Hawaii's constitution. She formerly was a professor of political science at UH West Oahu and was a two-term League of Women Voters Hawaii president. And she's really been an active voice in helping the League develop positions on the Hawaii Constitutional Conventions. Now, I forgot one thing before I introduced Anne, and that is also with us is Rosemary Muller, and she is Vice President of the League in Hawaii, and she's, I believe, co-chair, co-president of 
the League of Women Voters here on the Big Island. And thank you to everybody in the League of Women Voters who's made this possible. So um, Anne will now take us through what we need to know. And when Anne finishes with what she's talking about, probably about 20, 25 minutes, then we'll hear from Mr. Nonaka. So Anne Fetter Lee, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Sherry. I appreciate your introduction. <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about why we have a census every 10 years that leads us to apportionment and redistricting. Now, when the United States Constitution was written, the framers, and I, you may remember some of this from your history classes a long time ago, the framers came to a number of compromises. One of them had to do with whether there would be just one house in the Congress or two. And they eventually agreed that there would be one chamber that had two represented, two people from every state, no matter how big or small. And uh, another one where there would be according to population. So every year we take a census because that's the only way we could figure out how many people um, each state would get in the House of Representatives. And uh, they follow a very complicated process for deciding how many each state gets. Now in Hawaii, it's quite simple. We only get two. So we don't have to worry about a large number. But California, for example, gets a much larger number, maybe 45 or so. Now states take this process very seriously because it means that they may gain or lose seats in Congress. And of course, everybody would like to have as many seats as they possibly can, because then you have a little bit more uh, influence. So when Hawaii started out be being a part of the United States, we were not included in the census because the census was only for states. Hawaii was a territory for a long time, and during that time, the U.S. Census did not take place here. But <clears throat> the local, the territorial legislature had to figure out how their districts would be drawn for the local legislature. And so they used a number that was very easy to get, which is registered voters. And they did their uh, redistricting, although they weren't very happy about doing it, on the basis of registered voters. Now, when Hawaii became a state in 1959, and then in 60, 1960 was the first presidential election that Hawaii took part in, there was a lawsuit challenging using the registered voters as the number to use to draw the districts. The districts had to be about the same in terms of population. But if you know anything about registered voters, you know that not every area has the same rate of voter registration. Some districts are, have a high registration, other districts have low. So using registered voters is somewhat problematic because you're not, you might have the same 10 registered voters in every district, but the total number of people there will be very different. And so the governor at that time, Governor Burns, challenged the use of registered voters. It's a case called Burns v. Richardson. Burns was the governor and he did not like the fact that registered voters was used. <clears throat> and so he sued his lieutenant governor, who was uh, Bill Richardson, who later became the Hawaii Supreme Court Chief Justice. That case went all the way to the United States Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said, I'm sure uh, Governor Burns was not happy that it was okay to use registered voters because at that time, everybody was excited about voting in Hawaii. So there was a high number of registered voters. And so the, the court decided that it was fairly um, equal in terms of the district. So if you had 10 registered voters in every district, then you had maybe 20 total people. That was okay. It was, there was a substantial equivalence there. Uh, maybe we could have the next 
slide, please. So um, over the years, the, the reapportionment in Hawaii has created a lot of commotion. The general public doesn't like it when it happens because they don't really quite understand what's happening. And that's understandable. It's not an easy subject to understand. The politicians, the people that hold office, definitely don't like it. It makes them terribly nervous because they don't know what's going to happen to their district. For a number of years, they've got accustomed to the people that are in their district who are voting for them and supporting them. And they can be pretty, you can learn quite a bit about what's going on in your district by looking at voter uh, returns. So they don't want anything to change. They would like to keep the people that have been supporting them in the past in their district. And the people would, who are in the district would like to keep their legislator because they know that person and they don't want any change. None of us are happy with change. So it's a, it's a process that's fraught with uh, lots of anxiety and nervousness. And you know, as you know now, there are some stories about uh, some districts that, that will have incumbents running against each other. Well, nobody likes that. It makes everybody very nervous because you don't know what's going to happen. <clears throat> now, be, um, the apportionment. There are some. There are some ideas of what makes the apportionment a fair process. The districts need to be substantially equal in terms of population. That's a bigger population, not just registered voters. There needs to be geographic con continuity, continuity, contiguity, excuse me. There needs to be a sense of partisan fairness. And you need to try and make sure that communities of interest are kept together that boundaries are respected uh, for municipalities and counties and compactness and competitive may also be considered. Now in Hawaii, these things create some problems because we're an island state. If we were just a square flat piece of land and I don't want to offend anybody in uh, Utah, like Utah or Nevada, then things would, might be a little bit easier, but we're not. And even those places are not flat and with people living in perfectly equidistant spots from each other. We have island units. Maybe we could see the next, the next slide. Uh, one of the things that happens with reapportionment is that the people that are doing it, and very often it's the legislators themselves that are doing the reapportionment. Hawaii is a little bit special in that we have a commission that was um, adopted in, I have it written down here if I can remember, um, 1968, the idea of having a commission was adopted. But in most states, it's the legislature, legislators themselves that do the uh, reapportionment. And some people think that has advantages, some people not. The reason why we went to a having a commission, a bipartisan commission, because the idea was that this takes politics out of the whole process. Well, that is not, that's something we could laugh about because you can never take politics out of a political process. So it, it doesn't work quite the way they thought it would. And, um, but gerrymandering is one way that people can, who are doing the reapportionment can try to manipulate what happens. So next slide, please. Let's look at the next slide. Here's an example of racial gerrymandering in North Carolina. So you can see here that the districts were drawn in such a way as to just scoop in certain people here by race. This, the courts have said, is not acceptable. If somebody can show that the districts were drawn in order to just scoop in people of a particular race, 
that will probably be thrown out by a court. But other kind of gerrymandering has not been found to be um, improper. So, uh, for example, if, if now we've heard some people say that there has been gerrymandering politically for the districts in Hawaii now. The problem is that if you tried to challenge that in court, you probably wouldn't get very far because the courts have said gerrymandering for partisan purposes is okay. Uh, we might not like it, but uh, uh, the, the courts have not thrown it out. <clears throat> so it would be up to the legislator, legislature to say that you can't do any kind of partisan uh, gerrymandering. Now, if you look at a map and you see a district that has a strange shape, you cannot immediately conclude that it has been gerrymandered. Because, again, I come back to my point, we are not all spread perfectly out on a flat surface. We have roads, we have hills, we have lakes and rivers and uh, apartment buildings where lots of people are living and other areas where there aren't very many. So you cannot just look at the shape and decide that something has been gerrymandered. It may have been, but just the shape alone is not going to tell you. You're going to have to look and see who are the people that are included in the district and are certain groups excluded uh, intentionally. The problem is it's very difficult to prove that. Now, um, so we've, we've, looked, we've seen this map. Now we can look at the next one, the next slide. I have to turn it around. Now in Hawaii, we have a constitution, state constitution, we have statutes, the revised statutes. If you want to look at detail, please Google Hawaii revised statutes, chapter 25, and there you will see a lot of detail about the duties and what the Reinforcement Commission does and uh, et cetera, all kinds of details if you're interested in that. So please go and look at that. It's not all listed here because I don't think anybody really wants to see all that here today. Uh, next slide, please. And um, here's just part of that for the, the duties of the commission. They cannot favor a particular person or political party. Well, they may, in fact, they, the districts must be contiguous. Um, especially when they're, but that cannot happen when there's more than one island. They must be compact. They must follow permanent and easily recognized features such as um, geographical factors. They must be included within congressional districts and avoid submerging in a larger district of a different socioeconomic interest. So we can come back to some of those if you have some questions. Now, initially, the, the state constitution said that registered voters would be used as the, the numbers for determining the districts. That was changed in 1970. Um, I'm sorry, I have it, I have it written down because I can't remember the, um, but it's, I don't have to look it up. For the year here, 19, 19, 1990 something. Can't find my note now. Uh, it, it was changed to be permanent residence because that's what the court in 1980 said had to be used. The registered voters was not permissible because it left lots of people out. And the um, Constitution was changed as well as the state, the Hawaii Revised Statute, so that it says now permanent residence. That creates other problems because then you have the commission has to decide who's who's a permanent register, who's a per permanent resident, and who is not a permanent resident, and this can create some problems. So let's look at the next slide, please. 
this just outlines what the Constitution covers, which is how, what years are going to be reapportionment years. It says more about the commission. It says something about the chief election officer. This has been changed very recently. None of these things stay the same forever. So it used to be that the lieutenant governor was, was the chief election officer, but everybody thought that that was a little bit too close to the political center. So it was changed and the election office is now a separate, completely separate independent office. Now, I want to define what it means when it says in the constitution or in the Hawaii Revised Statutes, what is a basic island unit? Now, as you know, we have a number of islands here and we have counties that are, some counties that are made up of several islands. For example, Maui County is made up of Maui and Lanai and Molokai. I'm right, I hope. My brain is not totally fried yet. And Kauai has Kauai and Niihau and the Big Island as the big island, right? Okay, so the, the, those are the basic island units. And there are some requirements about the basic island units that must be followed when the districting is done. First, the, uh, the commission has to decide how many representatives and senators each basic island unit gets. They must have a minimum can't just leave one, can't leave one basic island unit without any representation in our state legislature. And um, that's the first thing. Then once they, it has been decided how many they get, then they will apportion the, the, the number of districts within each basic island unit uh, according to the, again, making sure that the districts are very similar. There's also some confusion about the senators because some of them, they're staggered. They have staggered terms. And, um, but everybody has to run for election at the next election, even if they were elected to a longer term. Um, at the same time that the commission is doing the districts for our local legislature, they are also doing the districts for our members of Congress, two members of Congress that we have. So um, that's the, a second part of their job. And let's see, now we could go to the next slide, please. So I was talking a moment ago about the apportionment within the basic island units. These are the main guidelines that must be followed. Now, there was, a t there was a time when Hawaii had districts that are referred to as multi-member districts. We now don't have them anymore, but we could return to them. You can see here, number seven, it says, there must not be more than four members from any one district. And we had multi-member districts until 1980, when the, the court had to set up a special group to draw new maps. And when the courts do that, it's called a court ordered plan, they must not have any multi-member districts. Some people like multi-member districts, others say it's not so good, who knows? It, but in any case, once we got the, multi, the single member districts, it's unlikely that we will go back to multi-member districts. Now, let's see. So the, within the basic island unit, the, let me just make another point. There are several levels of criteria that must be followed. One is we have state law and state constitution that provide the guidelines for how the commission is to draw the district. There are also court cases that have been handed down over the years that guide what must be done or what can't be done and what can be done, and basically provide the, 
the grounds upon which a, a reapportionment plan can be challenged in law in court. Not, I'm not proposing that that's a good thing to do, but those are the 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 points that would be picked up by somebody who wants to challenge in court. And one of the most important things that has come out of the court cases is that the number of people, whatever you're counting, in each district must be just about the same. This is very small difference for the congressional districts. So two districts that we have in Hawaii, where we elect our two representatives, must be almost identical in terms of the number of people in them. Now, when I say people, we're not talking about the total census figures, we're talking about permanent residents. And of course, there may be some challenges as to what's the proper definition of permanent residents. Now, as far as the state districts go for our state Senate and state house, the difference in population figures can be a little bit bigger, but it must be less than 10%. Because otherwise, we're not providing equal representation for everybody. I live in a district where there are lots more people than you live, than the district in which you live, then I am being overrepresented and you're being underrepresented. That's something we absolutely don't want to have happen. So I think I will stop here now. And I think it's about 20 minutes. Sherry, is that right? I will stop. And I, I probably made everybody even more confused than they were before but I can try to answer some questions later on. Okay. Um, what we will do before Anne takes questions is we're going to turn to our second speaker, and that is Dylan Nonaka. Um, Mr. Nonaka is a member of the State Reapportionment Commission. And Michelle, you can go past this slide. Yep, there's Dylan, just in case you can't see him on the screen. He's a local boy born and raised on the Kona side of the island at University of Hawaii. He studied political science and economics. And currently he's the broker in charge at Coldwell Banker, but he has a long history in politics. And I wanna mention, by the way, he's an Iraqi war veteran. He was a Marine and he's still a company commander in the National Guard. He has curtailed, I think, his political work a bit as his family grew, and he's moved into different things, such as being on the State Reapportionment Commission. But he was the Republican Party's Hawaii County Chair. He served as Governor Linda Lingle's East Hawaii Liaison. He served as Charles DeJue's Chief of Staff when Mr. DeJue was in the Honolulu Council. And he was the Executive Director from the state for the State Republican Party. And some of you may remember how exciting it was in 2012, if you watched the Republican convention, Dylan Nonaka, local boy from the Big Island, he was chosen to lead the Pledge of Allegiance. And I thought that was a pretty cool honor, not just for him, but for the whole state. So Dylan Nonaka, please take it away. And as you talk, if you could just do a definition as we're starting, could you tell us what the difference is between reapportionment and redistricting, because those terms are used a lot interchangeably, and I'd like you to make sure we all understand. So, Dylan. Sure thing, and thank you, Sherry, for the awesome introduction, appreciate that. Um, and, and Anne did an amazing job, um, I think, laying out the framework and, and introduction of why we do this and where the authority comes from and all those different things. So the first thing about reapportionment and redistricting. So reapportionment is reapportioning the number of seats that either a state or in our case, a basic island unit gets. And so that's based upon our population and the total count. And so like nationally, they will reapportion based on like, right, we're seeing trends where people are leaving California and then moving to Texas or Nevada or other states. And so when those states grow and a state like California shrinks, they get less seats and other states get more, more seats. And so the same, happens here on our islands if the population shifts from one island to another or one island grows at a faster rate than another island, they will get more representation. And we saw that 10 years ago in the state Senate for the Big Island where the, the Big Island got 
uh, fourth state Senate seat based on the growth. And we're just on the cusp of getting an eighth uh, house seat on the Big Island, but the population uh, this time didn't make it. So probably 10 years from now, you will see the Big Island get an eighth um, state house seat. So that's reapportionment, redividing the seats up. And then once that's done, then we have to redistrict, which is actually redrawing the lines and specifying what the boundaries are for a specific uh, House or Senate seat or congressional seat, which we also did this year, is, is to redraw the our two congressional districts. It's not going to change very much, but there is uh, potentially going to be a small change in that line on in, in West Oahu. So there's a lot to talk about with this. I would like to focus, I'll, I'll do a, a kind of a quick intro here, but I would like to focus on questions that you guys have because it is a complex process and that's something I think that is taken for granted in the public's view of this and definitely something that we see um, in the commission meetings where the, the input is, is very passionate and, and, and thoughtful, but sometimes not constructive when it comes to our job to redraw the lines. And what I mean by that, and let me do a quick disclaimer here for Royce and David, who I appreciate coming on the, the meeting, is they, they are the staff and they take a lot of heat sometimes for what's going on in reapportionment. They have a very hard job of, of organizing our meetings, working with the software, providing resources to the commission, doing lots of different things, but they do not make the decisions on where these lines go. So don't blame them if you don't like the way the, way the lines are, blame us, right? So um, they get they take a lot of phone calls and a lot of heat and, and, and go to these meetings and provide public information. But really the commission are the ones that make the decisions and vote on these things and ultimately are, are should be held responsible. So, so with that, it's a very complex process where we go into this understanding people are going to be upset. There is zero chance in the world we can go through this process and please everybody. And so if you're sensitive and you know you don't like people criticizing your work, this is not the job <laughs> or a, a, a commission to serve on because it's, it's, it's literally impossible because of the very strict guidelines that we have that we have to follow that, that and talked about with population and we have to stay within certain population boundaries. And so what that causes is it, in many cases, will cause communities not to be held, held together, right? So if you're in a community and you're in a geographic area, and we can use Lower Puna for an example. So if you start from Lower Puna on the, on the east side, and you start against where the lava flows are, right? You're not going to go any further south than that because one of the things is the communities have to be connected. So you cannot connect Pahala with Lower Puna, even though geographically it looks close together, there's an active lava flow in the middle and you can't drive in between both areas. So naturally you would start from Lower Puna and then move up north along the coastline and take in population until you get to, the target population is around 28,000 this year. So when you get to that number, you have to stop. You cannot keep going, right? And then and then the next district will, will, will start and then you'll start going up into Hilo. And then when you get up to the target district, you have to stop. And so what that causes in many cases, especially in, in uh, dense, po densely populated areas, is there is no way to keep a, a community together 100% of the time. And it's really messy on Oahu. It's a little bit better on the neighbor islands, but if you've taken a look at the maps for the big island already, um, you know, there, there's splits in Hilo, there's splits in Kona. Kona this time will, will most likely have three separate representatives. The, the northern part of it will be with Waimea. The central part of it, because Kona has grown so much, has enough population just to have one representative. And then starting at around Laco Street, you're going to have another representative that's going to wrap all the way down the southern part of the island. So someone may look at that and say, this doesn't make any sense. Why are you cutting Kona up into three different districts? Um, and I totally understand the criticism. It's just, there's nothing we can do about that. Popu we, we have to stay within the guidelines of the population deviations and that's just the way it works out so understanding that you have to understand that when lines and we're getting to nitty-gritty here right we talked about the high level why this happens and what 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 we have to follow but then when you actually get into the line drawing it's 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 nitty-gritty it's like it's 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 census block by census block and that's how we have to look at the maps is that the census has drawn up um divisions within our communities and you know we can see on the map there's 25 people in this one there's 75 people in this one there's two people in this one as as you add census blocks 
the software will then, and that's what Royce um, is our, you know, is, is the main man on is, is, is helping us through that process of, of when you start moving lines and adding census blocks in, then the population changes on the total count. So then that's what you're watching for when you're building those lines. And so it's a very intricate, complex process. And when someone says, you know, I don't like the way where this line is, if we were to change it, it has a ripple effect on the entire rest of the island's lines because if you take from one, you have to add to the other one and then so on and so forth. And so it's not as simple as just saying, I'd rather have this line here or there in some specific, specific community because there's going to be a larger effect on all of the rest of the lines. And so when what we've been asking for and what I would ask for your help in um, spreading the word on to people who want to have a uh, a say in the process and have, provide input in the process is we is we really need a holistic approach when it comes to basic island units where we and 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 that's something a requirement that we've made very clear from the beginning is that we won't just take a map that shows us one district but you have to submit if you're going to submit a map or proposal it has to be of the entire island unit because we have to see what the rest of the districts look like and what the and that the population balances and a lot of times I mean that's that's not a simple process. It is, it is very accessible, which, which I'm very happy about. It was great 10 years ago and it was, it's much better now, but it's very easy. And I know we have a slide with all of the links on it to the State Office of Elections website where you can log into the software, create an account. Um, there's, there's narrated training by Royce on that uh, website where you can it will walk you through using the software and, and how to use the different tools. But it's a very open process, right? Anybody can go in here and create an account, create maps, and then submit those maps for consideration uh, by the by the commission. So that's what I would encourage um, if you know you really want to deep dive into this. But I would you know more. I'd rather focus on kind of what the, what's interesting to you guys and what you, what your questions are because I could talk about this for three hours and how <laughs> it's a very it's a very complex process. But as as said earlier, you know, it's very, very important and. Um, it's a lot of time and effort for a commission that's that that's unpaid, but I think everybody on the commission understands the importance of this and um, and takes it very seriously. So going forward, and I know I think we have another slide with a timeline on it. Uh, we're we're going into tomorrow. We're going to have a commission meeting where the draft maps will be officially proposed, and then going forward, the the public. Uh, hearing process begins. And so there'll be a few weeks and we have the schedule, the proposed schedule, we're going to vote on that tomorrow. Uh, we do have a proposed schedule of where the public hearings will be. Most of them will be on Zoom. But after that process, the commission will then again consider making any additional changes and final changes before voting. So we're, we're early in the process still, but the meeting tomorrow will not be to change any lines. We're, we're simply proposing the maps that are drafted and then we'll go out to the public hearing process and then revisit the maps once that's complete. So with that, I'll take, I'll take questions if you got any, Sherry. Okay, well, we do have questions, but basically what you're saying relative to public input, the public hearings that are up on the screen right now, this is for the state reapportionment. And then the county also, each of the counties has its own redistricting commission. And for example, here in Hawaii County, the county redistricting has meetings coming up starting tomorrow, actually. So people- it's two, it's, two, it's two separate processes. So the state exactly. reapportionment commission does the state legislature and Congress, and then each county has a separate commission that will redraw the county council lines. So basically you could find yourself um, sort of conflicted because you like the state way things are drawn, but you may not like the county way things are drawn. So looking at all of the maps really is important if we think we want to have input, as I understand it. Yeah, you have, you have to provide input to the right body, <laughs> the right. right commission, yes. So here's a question that maybe for you, Dylan, or maybe for Royce or David, how has the use of computer algorithms affected the redistricting process here in Hawaii? I would say specifically talking about algorithms, not at all. Um, there is no automated, other there's one automated process, but it's not really an algorithm. It's just a, it's just an integrity check. So the co computer software has greatly increased the efficiency of this process and made it more public and transparent because the public can actually go in and do this themselves, use the same exact software that we use. 
the the only automated part of the process is when we're done and we have a map that, that we think we like, we can run an integrity check and the computer goes through a nine step process to make sure that uh, one, the districts are compact, that they are within the deviations. There's all kinds of different checks to make sure that they meet the, the basic criteria. And again, you know, as humans, we can have a different opinion on whether or not they meet the right criteria or not, but you can program in some of those things. And a lot of times what gets caught if we just miss a census block when we're changing, um, you know, adding a section of a community into another district and we may miss a census block, the computer will check that to, to make sure that we add it in. So it's, it's uh, that's the only automated process. Royce or David, maybe you can address, if somebody goes to, follows the links and goes into the maps, is it easy to find, for example, my address so I know where I fall in that? Um, are the maps that specific where people can actually get down? Because as Dylan noted, there's some changes coming up where there might be the people across the street are in one district and I am in another district as, has, as exists in Pahoa, for example right now so you, you can't put in an actual street address i mean you can definitely drill all the way down and see very so if you know where you live on a street it the, the maps are very clear you can drill all the way down uh, onto a street and then you can see where the line is so it's pretty easy to identify you can't but you can't like google map search your address and then have it pop up <laughs> on the on the map okay well actually one add in to that um we do have two different set well actually three sets of maps but two sets of interactive maps. So Dylan's been talking about and what most people are thinking about is the online application where you can go in and create your own plan, right? But once a plan has been proposed or even to look at the current districts, we have some other interactive maps that don't require a login, right? If you're gonna use the online application, you gotta have a login, blah, blah, blah. We do have another set of interactive maps that do not require a login. The link's on the reapportionment page. I can put it in the chat window in a minute if somebody else doesn't have it handy. But on those interactive maps, there is an address search where you could actually put in your address and it'll take you right there. A question that has come up is the Reapportionment Commission and the County Redistricting Commission have created maps or the staff has created maps based on input and so I see that James Hustis is with us, who is on the County Re Redistricting Commission. And Dylan, you can both answer the question. If citizens make input to the initial proposed maps, is there really the opportunity that you all are going to make a change? Or is this lip service? And let's start with you, Dylan. And then I'd like to ask James Hustis to comment on the county aspect. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a blunt and transparent person that you, it depends on your opinion. You know, if you, if you go to a county council meeting, do you think it makes a difference? <laughs> so, it, you know, I mean, it really depends on, on your opinion and, you know, how much you think the people that on that body are, are, are um, taking into account that information. Because I think we all know sometimes those votes are counted long before any, any, uh, any public testimony happens. But I also can um, attest that, you know, we have made changes in the past. If, if there's, if there's a legitimate, you know, we don't, the, the members of the commission don't know the state intricately, right? I mean, I'm pretty familiar because of my past experience. I do know the state geography pretty well, but mistakes can be made where, you know, maybe you link um, north, northeast and northwest Maui together where there's no road in between. And you may not know that, right? And there may be situations like that that, that, are, that are raised by the public and, we, okay. you know, we'll definitely take that into account. Okay, um, before I ask James the same question, I'd just like to remind everybody, if you do have a question, put it in chat. And if you don't know where chat is, it's down at the bottom of your Zoom screen. There's a box that looks like a message box and it says chat. And you can send the message to everyone or you can send it to me, Sherry Bracken, if you don't feel like sharing with the universe. But now James Houston, you're on the County Redistricting Commission, are you not? That's correct, Sherry. Yes, um, okay. I'm the vice chair for the county redistricting. Thank you. Okay, and James, as some of you may know, is president of Waimea Community Association, very active, and the Waimea Community Association has been sponsoring online forums, and that's we're very grateful for that. But James, if this community makes input, what's the realistic expectation that the county redistricting commission might change a map? 
Well, we've been trying to be very transparent. We know we've, um, we're in the process of having public hearings. We did have a deadline for public input maps. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we only received one map from the public given that deadline. And I know there were issues with the, the delay of the census data and getting the application up and running for the public. So that was a challenge. Um, so we had one map from the public. And so at this point going forward, it's really gonna be the commissioners creating these maps. Um, and tomorrow at our full meeting, we'll be discussing a number of these maps that the commissioners have made in more detail. So amidst the public hearings we've been having, we've, we're required to have one in each of the nine districts. Unfortunately, the first couple of them did not have any attendance. Um, but we've had a couple at the last couple meetings, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, our public hearings. And I know it's my intent to really, uh, you know, understand what people want and see with the maps and try and meet their criteria as best as po possible. Within reason, of course, we have, as Dylan talked about, we have the structure. Each of these districts has to reach 12,232 individuals or around there, given the, given the deviation that we're allowed. And just as, as Dylan mentioned, if we shift the bounds around one line, it's gonna bump all the other ones. It's a domino effect and it changes all the other ones around. And it, it really, really can make some uh, challenging efforts and uh, stress on the system when you're trying to say, well, I want Hawaii Paradise Park all in one. You know, that's almost a whole district in its own. It's, a, it's such a large population in that area that it, 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 it really only needs a little bit more to make its own district. And you kind of have to work around that without really gerrymandering or uh, absorbing other communities to make it part of it. So we have to kind of try to find line there. Okay, thank you so much. And thank you for being here. Um, a question, what are the best ways that citizens can contribute to the whole process of fair redistricting? We've talked about there can be citizen input and we have public hearings coming up. There's one tomorrow, I believe. I there, The schedule is in West Y today, this morning. Um, but Dylan, first, um, how can citizens really contribute to the process of fair redistricting? I think one, one thing is, is, is to bring specific um, information that really should be considered. Let me give you an example of that. So like when we're, when we're in Kona and we have to split Kona somehow, right? We're not gonna, we're not gonna be able to, to keep it all together. Um, you gotta make a decision. Is it better to split Malka of the highway or Makai of the highway, right? With South Kona. And, and that's something that, you know, somebody, because I'm from Kona, I understand Kona and, you know, I can provide information, but that's not the case around the whole state. But, you know, it may be, it make more sense to, to put Holoa Loa with South Kona because it's more of a farming type community than Ali'i Drive with South Kona, right? So when you get into those types of situations and you have nuances that you can make on the edges, those are the kind of really specific input that can help when people know their community because you cannot expect eight people from across the state to know the whole entire state well. And so those are the kind of things we're looking for. And again, just providing complete um, complete maps for, of the entire island because unfortunately we just can't realistically you know, take single districts and single areas into consideration because of the complexity of the, the whole mapping process. Um Anything that um, Anne you want to add on that question or James or no? I agree with Dylan though. I can understand how challenging it is. <laughs> you move one line, you have to move all lines. Um, it, a question that has come up in the past is we have a number of prisoners in various prisons and jails throughout the state, even in Arizona. Where are those prisoners counted? They're counted at their homes. Okay, so if someone's in prison at Halava Prison on Oahu, if they live here on the Big Island, they're counted on the Big Island. Yes. Okay. Another question. And you know, and, and you know on that note, this, this, this was a debate that happened earlier, and maybe something that may be of interest here, and it's been of interest of, of mine. So this is something that is longer term, not just in this process, but needs some, some legislative and potentially a constitutional amendment that the, the public could push for. But the, the way the state and, and Anne had talked about this initially, we changed from registered voters to permanent residents. And so 10 years ago, there was a lawsuit that changed, um, that that created, um, basically made us redo the maps because, because 10 years ago, we used too much population is what the, the court decided based on the challenge. And what I mean by that is there, there, there is some interpretation as to what a permanent resident is in Hawaii. And 
So there's a mandate that we have to take out non-permanent students and, and military, which on the, on the face of it can, can, can somewhat make sense. And again, this is your opinion. My opinion is if there is a person in a community, irregardless of where they pay state income tax or where they claim it to be a legal residence, especially from the military, military standpoint, right? You're here for three years, your family is here, you live in that community, use the roads, use the parks. And based on the way the state court has interpreted this, we cannot count you. So you have districts, especially on Oahu, it doesn't affect the neighbor islands as much where they may have 10 or 15,000 people that just don't exist in the count when it comes to redistricting. And I think that is, doesn't, doesn't make sense in my opinion and um, doesn't represent communities well because you have a much larger, sometimes significantly, you know, 10, 20% more residents in a community, but because of the state mandate, you know, they get, they get removed. So that's a bigger picture thing. That's something to talk about and consider is the way we actually count I, I would agree with you, Dylan. I would completely agree with you. And we probably should work toward making another constitutional amendment regarding what's being counted. We should just, in my opinion, we should just take the census data and not Absol and not fudge absolutely. it, <laughs> and not change it. <laughs> but that's I what we did. I completely agreed with you, yeah. agree with you. Well, if you look at Oahu, there are a number of military members here on the Big Island. We don't have a military installation with a lot of people permanently stationed here. Mm -hmm. So yeah, on Oahu, it certainly has to make a difference. And that was the next question that came up was, in fact, is the current basis permanent residency only for reapportionment and redistricting a fair approach. And you've just addressed why there's definitely some issues with that. James, any- And, and, and another example, right, is, is let's, and talking about the Big Island and why that, that's a, a difficult um, equation to solve is if you live on the West Side of the Island, you know, many people here don't live here, right? We're tons of snowbirds, tons of second homeowners. Some of you guys may be, you know, a part of that. If you were here on census day, you're accounted, right? If, you, if you, your door was knocked on, you, you were counted, but you may not live here nine months out of the year. Um, same thing with students. UH Hilo, I, I believe they took out 400 students in the non-permanent resident count. There's like 1,200 that pay out-of-state tuition. So there's a discrepancy as to how we're counting people. And so there's so many ways to interpret it that to me, the simple way is you count everybody and, and you don't, um, you know, you don't pick and choose who is a permanent resident, who isn't, because that's a very hard thing to define. Well, a question about the military. If military members are registered to vote here, do they count here? Do they count where they're the way, the, the way the way they gave us military data is that if they are if they claim a, a home of residence outside of the state, we remove them. So, um, and 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 if anybody who served in the military, you know that a lot of people in the military claim uh, states with no income taxes or home residence doesn't matter where they came from, <laughs> right? So it has very little to do with what their permanent residence is. Good to know. I'll think about that. <laughs> if, I, if I may just add one other point, and that is <clears throat> that a military family that lives, let's say, on Oahu, who has a problem will go to the local legislator to say what the problem is and ask the legislator to please try and address that issue. So they are getting represented anyway even though they're not being counted in the numbers. So I think that's just an additional reason why we should count everybody. Um, before I turn this back to Donna Oba for some concluding remarks, we do have really an, an overall overarching question. And that is aside from trying to figure out what the right numbers are in the right districts, what are the overall objectives of the commission when proposing a redistricting plan? Dylan, start with you. Um, to stay within the guidelines that you know we're mandated to stay within. I mean, there's a million different agendas that go into this process, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there's there's political agendas, community agendas, there's all kinds of things that go into it. You have to find some type of of happy medium and something that makes sense to everybody and that everybody can can agree on. Um, but it, it's pretty there's a lot of there's a lot of mandates and 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 cover them i mean a long list of things that we have to follow and to build a map that stays within all of those guidelines plus does our best to make sense for communities is is hard enough and that's 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 got that's always the the number one objective got it james Hustis, anything else that you could add to that since you're on the county redistricting Can yeah I you know and just to jump back to your, you know, I'm not sure about the, just to jump back to your previous question, share about the prison population. 
Hmm. We're here at the, the county redistricting. We're still having some difficulty with that because we've been informed that that those people have been counted at those prisons. And I've seen those blocks at Kulani and so forth that are being counted there. So we're having some challenges there. It needs to be changed at the state level. Um, so jump into your current question. You know, as Dylan said, we need to stay, we have guidelines. We have these guidelines that we need to adhere to. We have the deviations we have to follow and really are grateful for any of the input and guidance that the community can provide. We have long meetings and we appreciate, you know, any of the testimony that people give and share with us. Um, number of public meetings coming up and we're grateful for anyone that can attend and really share the Mana'o about their communities and their neighborhoods that really can guide our conversations. So thank you. Thanks for having me. Great. Thank you so much to everybody for the questions and to our speakers for the input. Donna Oba with League of Women Voters is going to add a few things before we say aloha. And I just want to thank you because this kind of education is so helpful for us and everybody's opinions. And just so you know, if you haven't gone to the chat, do so because Sandy Ma, um, who's with Common Cause, has given us some input on some of the prison issues. So, Donna Oba. Thank you, Sherry. Um, I think we learned a lot, drawing the maps, changing the maps, making everyone happy. <laughs> this is really tough. Um, and it looks like we might have more changes in the future. I really wanna applaud the state and county redistricting commissions. Um, it's not an easy job. Thank you for your public service. The league actually has a position on the redistricting and we've had one um, that evolved since really the 1960s. Um, Michelle, if you can just show what that is. And I, I'd like to applaud again, the commissioners again, because I think you're trying, to, we're lucky in Hawaii. Um, a lot of these standards um, that are our goals um, which are enforceable standards, fair representation at all levels of government, and public participation is being done here in Hawaii. So thank you very much for that. I, I want to remind everyone again that in the 2022 elections, um, every legislative office, state reps, um, state senates, um, are up for re-election. It normally does not impact offices whose boundaries don't change, such as the state boundary or a county boundary. But it just so happens that 2022 coincides with Hawaii's gubernatorial election cycle. So we'll see the governor and lieutenant governor races on the ballot, which we've already been hearing about. So when we do have the elections next year as a leaguer, I wanna invite you to find election and candidate information on our election website, which is vote 411.org, V-O-T-E, the number four, the number one, the number one.org. So a big mahalo to our presenters, Dr. Ann Lee, reapportionment commissioner, Dylan Nonaka, for taking the time to share your knowledge and to answer our questions. Uh, mahalo to David Rosenbrock and Royce Jones. Some of our slides uh, came from them and, and we will also post a, a training um, presentation that they have, and you can look on YouTube for more training videos. Um, but they provided some background for us about the mapping software, and they will be happy to answer your questions. We're going to post this web uh, the webinar on our league websites. It's on the screen, and we'll put it in the chat. And then thanks to Sherry for coming out of retirement and moderating this webinar. Um, thank you to my colleagues, Rosemary Muller, Vice President of the League of Women Voters of Hawaii, and Michelle Mitsumori, uh, Director for the Hawaii County League for the support in creating this webinar. And finally, the League of Women Voters of Hawaii, and I thank you for your attendance and questions today. Feel free to you know, ask us any more questions and um, and directly, we can always forward your questions to our speakers. So mahalo and aloha, and please vote. <laughs>